Welcome to this IANA webinar, Inside the Numbers, 2019 Year in Review and 2020 Outlook. I'm Hal Pollard, the Director of Education at IANA, and it's great to have you join us. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenters from the TTX company, Pat Casey, Vice President of Fleet, Peter Wolf, Director of Market Development, and John Woodcock, Director of Market Development. They'll be talking about the current economic conditions, the 2019 IANA numbers, and a year in review, then take a look at international and domestic intermodal and wrap up with questions. Let's get started. Pat? Thank you. Hello, everyone. So we're going to talk uh, briefly about the economic overview. So in, the, uh, in 2019, about 2.3% growth in GDP, and a lot of that uh, fell in, in the uh, last three quarters. Uh, they were about 2% growth after over 3% in the first quarter of last year. And then you see the data on Q4. Um, a lot of that growth was net exports, which really was a big drop in the number of imports that happened at that time that pushed up GDP. Uh, inventories pulled things down. Consumption helped to push it up, but it was uh, slower than the last two quarters in uh, consumption spending in the fourth quarter. And so we do see that being a, a little bit lower in 2020. And the coronavirus, we'll talk a little bit more about that, could drive it down a lot more than that. So you see employment uh, is still very strong. The unemployment rate is very low. It's a 50-year low from what it's been. And we see employment uh, growing quite a bit. And uh, what uh, happened in January, which is not quite on the slide because it was very recent, uh, was 225,000 additional jobs during that time. So uh, things remain pretty strong there. Wage growth is pretty solid, average about 3 to 3.5%. Three uh, in 2019, and 3.1% uh, in January. Industrial production has been declining uh, quite a bit over the last 18 months, trending down, uh, still negative in, in January of 2020 uh, for both manufacturing and total production. And uh, part of that is just an overall slowdown. Uh, but two other things that have affected that are uh, Boeing's production has slowed down. And that's a big part of uh, manufacturing production. And then coronavirus has had an effect on uh, exports, and many of those are produced in industrial production. So then if you look at uh, the ISM index, which is an indicator of future industrial production, it has turned up a little bit over 50 in January of this year after it had trended down since early in, in the, or actually in, in the mid-2018. So Things may be turning up a little bit, went, uh, went up over 50 for total, uh, but also for new orders and new export orders as well. So we'll see where that goes. And again, the coronavirus could change how that goes. We do expect consumer spending to be a little slower in 2020. Um, and a big part of that is that you had the tax cuts that, that really drove up consumption in 18 and somewhat 19. And now they're slowing down a little bit. So the last slide on, on the economy shows uh, many different forecasts that we're looking at, and much of it are somewhat slower, not only just GDP, but consumer spending, retail sales. We do see investment going up a little bit. Housing starts slowing down a little bit, uh, but that's been pretty strong recently. We'll see where that goes. Uh, also important to note that um, you know, Mexico and Canada are expected to turn up and uh, this is the you know, Intermodal Association of North America, and uh, those are important parts of that as well. And so, you know, coronavirus could push down things a little bit, but if there was a major surge in coronavirus, that might cut U.S. GDP in half. So we'll see where that goes. Um, it's very difficult to predict that, but there are some estimates of uh, where that will go. And, and in China, it would go from about 6% down to about 1%. So uh, thank you. and. Uh, answer your questions later on. Hello and good afternoon or good morning on the, the West Coast anyway. And uh, we have a couple of sections to review. For the latest numbers, I thought I would run through the next few slides quickly. And then when I talk about the international intermodal section or John talks about the domestic intermodal section, we'll try and give a little bit more why to the numbers. So what we typically do is we go through the, the IANA's uh, ETSO database, the ETSO standing for equipment type, size, and ownership, but it includes other things, you know, data by origin and destination, 
data comes monthly. Uh, for this webinar, we're, we've summed the data for annual for 2019 and what we think is going to happen in, eight, in uh, 2020. And then typically when we do a webinar and later in the year, it's either on a quarterly or a semi-annual basis showing the numbers. Um, in any case, for 2019 was not really the best year for intermodal. You can see that on the screen that just about um, all the segments, all the regions, everything uh, showed up negative. And I think Pat talked a little about some of the reasons why, and we'll discuss that in a little more detail on some of the other slides. One thing to note on the left side, where we're showing the domestic container numbers, overall domestic container fell 4.5%. And then we've split out the data for the first time, and all this data has been available for a long time in the EDSO database, which is the O for ownership. We split out private and rail uh, owned um, containers. So rail slipped 11.2% versus privates fell 1.6% for the year. And then when those are combined, you get the negative 4.5% loss for the uh, domestic containers. And then the next slide, slide 15, is very similar to what I just showed, uh, with the exception is that it shows the, um, the volume numbers as well. Um, and again, we'll talk about a little bit of the why in, in later slides. And if you look on the left where you have segment, you have the domestic containers. And you can see on the far right then for percent change, that fell 4.5%. And you can see that the domestic containers, when you break that out into private and the rail, the privates are pretty much twice the volume of the, the rail containers. And then the regional loadings, it's pretty much all regions except the Mountain Central declined in volume last year. And to add insult to injury, the one uh, region with that grew, the Mountain Central grew seven tenths of a percent, and it's actually about the smallest region. So it didn't add a whole lot of lift to rail loadings overall. And then the next slide, for people who have been on the call before, you may recall that we usually show the top six uh, growth lanes, and uh, this this year we can only show four because everything beyond the, these four is is negative. Um, and what's interesting. And we're still sorting through the data to understand it, but in the case of the southeast to the southeast region, we think that growth stems from uh, imports. We've seen a lot of growth on the East Coast, which we'll talk about in some upcoming slides, and that's driving East Coast IPI volume. And then the Midwest to the Midwest growth, that appears to be driven by domestic container growth. And we think what's happening there is that as uh, there's been fewer steel wheel interchanges last year and more rubber tired interchanges. And that may have resulted in loads getting billed twice. And so the database is correctly picking up on that, but it may be the same load. Uh, so maybe as an example, something from Seattle going to Cleveland, just making that up. And the old way was steel wheel interchange. And if the new way is rubber tired, you may get two bills. So with that same load is like say getting picked up twice. And then, um, unfortunately, we have no problem showing the uh, top declining lanes or slowest growing lanes uh, for 2019. Um, and in contrast, like I said, to the prior slide, this would all be uh, driven through less growth in the IPI volumes and less growth in the domestic container and trader volumes as well. And then the last slide in this section, um, just I would say more for scores to show what you can do with the database and to see what's out there is we sorted the international uh, intermodal loads by container size over time. And you can see that there's a relatively modest drop in the number of 20s over time, and the number of 45s, and the number of 40 containers as a share of the total uh, is growing. So as, a, as, a, <clears throat> excuse me, as an example, in the year 2000, 65% of the railroad loads of international containers were 40-foot containers and that was 3.5 million loads, again, 65% of the total. Uh, last year, that number uh, climbed to 75% of the total and 7 million loads. So the volume doubled in 20 years and the percent share changed by about 10%. The 20-foot container loadings, uh, those also increased over time from 1.6 million uh, containers in 2000 to 2.2 million last year, but as a share slipped a little bit and the 45s, those actually declined from about, call it 300,000 in, uh, in the year 2000 to 200,000 last year. 
So now let's talk about international intermodal, and maybe we can get a little bit into the why as to why some of the numbers changed. And just a, a quick definition, I, I, we've talked about this before, but international intermodal refers to the marine box, the 20, the 40, and the 45 foot container routing inland by rail. And it goes by different names. It might be called IPI, might be called intact, but it's all the same thing. So any discussion of international intermodal really needs to have a discussion about tariffs. And just the, how we view tariffs at, at, at TTX and try and put it all in perspective, there's about $575 billion worth of imports each year into the U.S. from China. And last year, about $250 billion, roughly half of the total, and nearly 90% of all industrial goods imported from China were tariffed at a 25% rate. Additionally, uh, starting in September, there was a 15% tariff on about one half of the remaining goods from China. And that, so 250 billion worth of goods were industrial goods. The remaining goods would be consumer goods. So think of half the consumer goods imported from China were hit with a 15% tariff. And that was starting in the middle of September. And that went to last Friday until February 14th, when that tariff was reduced from seven to seven and a half percent from the 15%. So for 2020, what we're looking at is pretty much the same amount of tariffs on the same goods that were tariffed last year, with a minor exception that some of the consumer goods have a slightly smaller tariff from 15% down to 7.5%. And so when you look at the imports from last year, which would be a big driver of international intermodal, we think North America imports only increased one-tenth of 1%. We're still waiting to get some data from Canada and Mexico. For the U.S., for 2019, imports fell one half of 1%, but they're not evenly distributed along the coast. So the East Coast, imports actually grew 4.3%, and in the West, imports actually declined 5.1%. And so when you're looking at the graph and you see 2018 grow at 7.5%, 2019 grow at one tenth of one percent. If you average the two together, you're getting a growth rate around 3.6, 3.8, depending on the compounding effect each year in 2018 and 2019. So the tariffs may not have necessarily reduced overall volumes because if you look backwards, you can see that there were some years, 2013, 2016, where imports grew in that 3.6, 3.8 range. So the tariffs may not have changed the overall volume, but they certainly pushed a lot of freight into 2018 to avoid the tariffs. And they also affected what coast the imports uh, landed on. And then for today, you know, as we think about 2020, our forecast is at 2.4%, which is a little bit less than what we've seen traditionally. And that may be, as Pat talked about, consumer spending uh, being at 1.5% forecasted for 2020. And then, of course, the million-dollar question is, how is the coronavirus going to affect all this? And we really can't say for sure. And, and Pat alluded to the fact that there may be two scenarios you're trying to think about. One is where perhaps the, the virus runs its course, and at the end of this month, beginning of next month, production starts to ramp back up in, in China. And by the end of the month, the middle of April, things are sort of back to normal from a shipping standpoint. The other scenario, which would be sort of a, I'll call it a darker scenario, more of a worst case scenario, you know, maybe a, a 15%, 20% chance that's going to happen. I mean, nobody really knows how the virus is going to run, but if you have a, a scenario where production is, doesn't come back in China for most of the year and China's GDP is growing, as Pat alluded to, or Lou mentioned, growing at 1% instead of a normal 6%, that would have a pretty uh, hard impact on the U.S. economy. But the likelihood of that is relatively small. So we'll have to see wh where it goes, but it definitely could have an impact. But for now, the forecast is for that 2.4% growth in imports. And if production resumes in China, as we suspect it will, the 2.4% is probably a pretty good number, or at least directionally accurate. 
And as we think about the impact of tariffs, we see that imports from China declined nearly 12% last year. And interestingly, the production was offset by growth from other regions. So as production from China fell, production from other East Asia, which would be Vietnam, Cambodia, Japan, Korea, made up for about half of the loss from China. And then South Asia, which would be uh, Bangladesh and India, made up for another 25% of what was lost from China, with Europe and Latin America maybe picking up some of the slack. And the significance of that is that, generally speaking, if production comes from East Asia, it's going to land on the West Coast. And if production comes from South Asia or Europe, it's going to land on the East Coast, which is why we saw so much growth in the East Coast and a decline in imports on the West Coast last year. So a couple of trends that we report on in each of the webinars is all water share, and we'll talk about transloading next. And I think the slide says it all, uh, the heading of the slide, that all water share um, increased about two share points last year. And just a reminder of the definition, this is where production from East Asia, whether it be China, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, production hitting the U.S. and Canadian East Coast as considered all water versus the West Coast, which was the shortest and typically the, the fastest route. And trying to understand why that grew 2%, you know, it, it's a little bit hard to get the data, but one place that we look to is the Drury uh, Container Freight Rate Report, which reports on the ocean carrier rates. And they published the report monthly, and last summer's report uh, had a, a, a sample market I was talking about freight moving to Memphis from Shanghai, and the rate over the West Coast was about $200 higher than if the container landed at an East Coast port. So if the rate is cheaper, you know, you sort of follow the money and say, well, that's less expensive. That may explain why all water grew 2%. And a little later on in the slide, we're going to talk about IMO 2020 and how that may be affecting freight rates. So we'll I'll pick up on this a little later. So the next slide is, is transloading. As I say, it's another trend that we watch closely. And unlike all water, I would say that transloading as a share of imports is, is fairly steady, really did not a whole lot of change. Since imports fell on the West Coast, transloading volume fell a little bit, but the share of imports was about the same as an example in the LA Long Beach area. Transloading was 34.7% of import TEUs compared to uh, 2018 was 33.7. Interestingly, uh, PSW imports, so imports into LA Long Beach, according to peers, fell about 5.6%, while our estimates of transloading fell about 2.5%. So transloading see, gained, a, gained a slight share. And like I say, for 2020, we think Transloading shell will be pretty steady. We'll have to see how volume goes depending on whether imports continue to migrate away from the West Coast, if production continues to migrate away from China this year, as we think it, it might. And part of the issue is if you see production migrate away from China, we won't really know if that is due to the tariff and, and shippers moving out of China or if it's a, a reaction to the coronavirus and production being shut down in China and shippers looking to find some temporary alternative supply to make up for the loss of production in China. And if that does occur, we think that'll come back over time uh, versus the tariff shift that may be a, a permanent shift away from China. But it'll be hard to see in the data for a while. And so the last slide I want to talk about um, is the IPI uh, slide, so the international remote volumes. And again, we saw, you know, imports fall, or I'm sorry, international intermodal fall 2.2% last year, but it, it varies by region. So in Canada, uh, international intermodal only slipped two tenths of a percent. Mexico, it slipped 6%. In the U.S., as the yellow box shows, it fell 3.7%. But again, it, it varied by region. So it says Eastern ports, but that should say IPI off of Eastern ports gained 4% last year, while IPI off of Western ports in the U.S. fell 7.9%. And for 2020, we're looking at relatively similar numbers. I mean, it, it's flat, 
so instead of falling 2.2%, it's going to be minus one tenth of a percent. But we're probably going to see that same split with Eastern ports gaining volume, Eastern IPI gaining volume, but offset by losses in the West. And again, how the coronavirus affects production in China is a wild card on this, and we'll have to see how that, that goes. And now I'll turn it over to John, and he can talk about the domestic intermodal. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off by uh, by talking a bit about the trucking market. Given that domestic market overall, its fortunes are directly correlated with the over-the-road truckload sector. We always um, spend a lot of time looking at the truckload markets to understand what has happened in the domestic intermodal markets. We look at a variety of metrics on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual basis from a variety of sources. The uh, Morgan Stanley Truck Freight Index, Truckload Freight Index, we find is a really good gauge on uh, what's happening within the cyclicality of, of the truckload market. So what, what this uh, graphic shows is the change in the supply demand balance in the um, freight sector on the, on the over the road truckload market from period to period, I believe it's every two weeks. And what you'll see is that really this, this illustrates that the, uh, the truckload market and freight demand in general is, is pretty cyclical. And so you go through this repeating cycle where the freight activity uh, accelerates, that causes a capacity capacity shortage or, or tightening capacity in the market. Shippers get to the point where they will get more flexible on, on their rate payments in order to secure that capacity. So you'll get rate inflation. That improves the profitability of the carrier base. The carrier base, in turn, uh, reacts positively to the improved profitability by going out and securing increased capacity through two primary means. One is buying more Class A tractors and, and as well as trailing equipment. And another is increasing pay for drivers in order to secure driver capacity as well as lower driver turnover, which is, of course, as most of you know, is a, a, a pervasive issue in the industry. And then the capacity will catch up and oftentimes will exceed the freight demand. And then we go into it a downward loop until we hit bottom and come back. As of today, we, we believe and most industry sources that, that we, we evaluate and we talk to believe we're probably about in the bottom of the, of the freight demand capacity cycle. As you can see, the, the purple line is 2018 and that's where we had the quote unquote freight mageddon where in the, in the wake of the ELD productivity losses as well as virgin, burgeoning demand uh, because of the tax cuts largely, in late 2017, we have very, very favorable conditions. And if you look at this graph, the higher you are on the graph, the tighter the conditions are. And so they actually had to reformat this graph in order to account for some of the uh, aggressive conditions that we had in 2018. Of course, as I was saying, as rates skyrocketed, it prompted carriers to go out and increase capacity. And as the freight demand dropped, in late 2018 going into 2019, you always have a lead time in bringing capacity on, maybe not so much with drivers, but with tractors. I believe in late 2018, the lead time on getting a tractor was over a year. And so companies were worried about getting on the bandwagon and get and securing capacity down the road so that the orders just piled on and piled on and piled on. And it's turned out into a situation in, in mid to late 2019 that capacity overdrove the headlights of demand as demand waned. And so, as you can see, as we're entering into uh, 2020, things are, are relatively soft, possibly not as soft as we had in, in some portions of last year. What feels really soft is actually about industry average for the last 10 years, but it, it certainly um, has much more of a, a palpable effect because it's so recent. And uh, of course, this is, is trickling down, particularly in the spot truckload market, where rates in the tr uh, spot market have come down as much as 30, 35%. Meanwhile, the contract market, which I think it's about 45% of total truckload carriage, the um, contract carriage has, has remained relatively stable with regard to pricing after some, some increases last year. So here's a, another illustration of what's happening with Class A tractor capacity. As you can see, the bar graph really, really highlights the, the cyclical nature of the industry. Um, so we had a massive order book fill up in late 2018 going into uh, 
uh, as we approached 2019, and then it, all the orders fell off. The lead time was too long for, for people to tolerate, as well as um, in October of 2018 is when freight demand um, started to get soft. And so that has, um, that has caused a big drop off in orders. Meanwhile, you have the lag effect of, of actual sales as those orders are processed. So we went from a, a, a backlog of trucking. I want to say the number was pr- approaching 500,000, if I'm not mistaken, back in late 2018. And it ended this year, I believe, uh, in the low to mid 100,000 range on class eight tractors. So the, 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 the market is, is still adding capacity because we still have that lag effect, but we are pretty close to being at equilibrium with, with freight demand. To give you some idea as to how much capacity has been added, ACT Research out of uh, Columbus, Indiana, indicates that capacity has grown about 13% of, uh, in the U.S. truckload market, Class 8 tractors, uh, between the beginning of 2018 and present. So 13% more tractors on the road that are in the active fleet, up to about 1.33 million units. So it's a dramatic increase in capacity that has been added. And it's going to take a while for freight demand to catch up with that, as well as some of the capacity to bleed out as some of the older truck, uh, trucks are retiring. One question some, some folks ask is, why are, are carriers still adding trucks at this late date? Uh, for a couple reasons. One is that the advanced technology that you're getting in the new Class A tractors is such that it still pays to to go with a newer tractor, one that has war- uh, has comprehensive warranties, but also has a lot of collis- collision mitigation systems as well as better fuel economy. Some of the new tractors that that we're seeing out in the market today are getting fuel economy between eight and a half and nine miles per gallon. So it's still paying to invest in the new technology. The, the ROI is, is positive. At the same time, we still have the holdover of the uh, 27 tax cut effect, which is accelerated depreciation or uh, more attractive depreciation schedules for carriers in which to amortize their, uh, the depreciation of their um, assets over a shorter period of time. So that, that's kept a lot of truckers in the game. That said, the health of truckers is deteriorating generally. Doesn't sound like alarm bells are going off, but there there's certainly an acceleration of carrier failures. I believe the rate in the end of 2019 was at about two times the rate of failures that we had in 2018. So uh, it seems like the rate is accelerating with the high cost of insurance as being the major bugaboo because of some very large settlements that have been made in accident cases. One number I've heard um, given recently is that some carriers are paying as much as um, twenty to $25,000 per tractor in annual insurance. And given that a typical tractor may get less than 80,000 miles a year, insurance is becoming one of the highest cost operating cost items that uh, a carrier faces behind um, behind the cost of the asset itself, driver pay, and fuel. So one proxy that we use for determining how quickly the uh, domestic market can grow on the intermodal side is we do a periodic census on the North American container fleet. And this is uh, specifically the 53-foot domestic container fleet. So we actually saw a fair amount of growth in 2019 surprisingly given that that business decline but this is this is of course a residual effect of some companies ordering to increase their positions in d- domestic containers during the during the stronger freight period that we had in 2018 so it's kind of hold over uh, capacity we're not seeing uh, much in the way of any container ads in 2020 just about uh, 2000 net that we know of so far this may go up a little bit the large Part of the increases in 2020 will be uh, related to the conversion opportunities uh, from trailer to container. So these are these are companies that are traditional TOFC operators that are flipping over their business in part or in whole from um, a trailer product to a container product. The traditional domestic container fleets uh, we're not hearing much in the way of fleet additions with the exception of possibly some replacement capacity that's coming in. So it'd be netting out at zero. So after the, the, the freight market, depending on, on your source of information, 
the over the road freight market last year grew anywhere from zero to two to two and a half percent, depending on the source, be it the one of the research houses uh, such as Act Research or FTR or the American Trucking Association's Cast Logistics, et cetera. But it was low single digits to flat overall truckload growth. In contrast, the uh, domestic container volume actually shrank last year. And this is really part of uh, part to, to a, a few different reasons. One is that there were some lane rationalizations last year by some of the carriers, and that possibly or possibly related to the PSR initiatives that, that several of the roads have, have put in place. So lane rationalizations, there have also been some differences in, in market strategy on pricing, and we won't go into that to any great detail, but spot markets on the, mar- on the truckload side crashed last year coming down as much as 30 35 percent in some cases railroads are much more players in the contract market so there's less pricing flexibility and so there is a certain amount of bleed off in market share because of price differences in certain lanes we're not expecting significant well we're not expecting any growth in 2020 we're actually expecting more of the same we're not expecting further lane rationalizations by the roads we think that they are They've, they've right-sized their networks, and they're starting to look for additional opportunities for growth, albeit on a, probably on a cautious lane-by-lane basis. Um, so they're, they're really going to have a very deliberative approach to their growth strategies. And we see that overall the, the truckload market is going to be flat, to slightly down, and that translates into our forecast of about a 1% decline on the uh, domestic container market. And, um, you know, the coronavirus that surges quite a bit. Another forecast has been that oil prices would drop by about a third in light of that, which would bring this down even more. Yeah. Also, another another downward pressure on this, and, and Peter alluded to this, was with regard to transload volumes. About 15% of North American domestic container volume is actually transload related. So it's actually, while we call it domestic container, it's really the... The, only the box is what's domestic. The freight that's in it is not necessarily domestically derived. And so there's a lot of import product that moves off the coasts in, uh, in domestic boxes. And the, uh, uh, the lower activity we have on the import side is actually adversely affecting the domestic container volume. So going into the other side, the, the smaller side of uh, the domestic market is the, the trailer market. Uh, much more volatile. Um, as you can see, it's it's up and down over the years, uh, but we had a significant shift downward last year, and that's uh, that's due to two reasons. One is uh, again lane rationalizations. There were some significant uh, lane rationalizations, particularly in the, in the east, on on trailer markets. So uh, railroads cut out some significant OD pairs that that served the trailer market, and at the same time. Uh, we're seeing that, as I alluded to in the domestic container census slide, we're seeing that more and more, uh, more and more traditional trailer operators are uh, taking the plunge and taking a position in domestic containers and converting over from from the T product to the C product, if you will. And we're expecting that to continue into this year with a full effect of a lot of the conversions that that started to take place probably in the middle of last year, around June and July is when we started seeing it, it starting to, to take hold and really anchored in the fourth quarter and, uh, and will continue on in uh, 2020. So not a, a rosy outlook for trailer, but the, the silver lining on this cloud is that those, that, that volume will actually move over onto the container side. So it's, uh, you could argue that it's a, a net wash. So overall, when you combine the, uh, the, the domestic container in with the trailers, we're seeing a, a decline of about 3.5% in the coming year. And, and that's coming off of a very disappointing 6.1% decline in uh, 2019. So it's not a very rosy forecast, but we think that it's, it's fairly realistic in the market. And if there's any optimism, it's that, as I alluded to earlier, we feel that we're at the bottom of the freight cycle, notwithstanding issues that um, exogenous issues such as the coronavirus. But we do feel like we're in the uh, the bottom of the freight cycle and that we'll probably start seeing some rebound in rates and market activity in the third quarter and, uh, and continuing on into 2021. So the next section that we've done the last uh, 
few webinars is what what are we watching? So I think each of us at John and myself, we should have a slide or two to talk about. So I think the next one is on the long and short term bond curve, and I'll turn it over to Pat. Yeah, so the inverted yield curve, which is higher interest rates for short term rather than long term loans, is a significant indicator of a recession. And you can see what that showed us before the 2001 2008 recession. Uh, we had a turn down last year from March till near the end of the year turn back up again, but trending down again as well. Uh, so this may be an indicator of a recession coming, especially when uh, we have the longest length of growth in the economy that we've ever seen. And then we've talked about this th throughout the, the presentation, so we'll have to watch and, and wait and, and see what's going to happen with, with the virus itself and what that does to uh, Chinese production. Uh, and again, the impact of the tariffs is CBD, what we saw in 2019 was the tariffs uh, reduced or seemingly reduced imports from China and resulted in production from other places. And we expect that to continue. So we'll have to see where all of that goes. And I think the, the slide here looks at the share of imports from China for various products. And you can see that everyone in the orange bar for 2019 is a little bit less than what you saw in 2017. And then slide 37, this is, I would say, a, a parallel slide to slide 24, which is the all-water slide that I talked about a, a few minutes ago. And the IMO 2020 uh, refers to the new rules that went into effect on January 1st, which require ocean carriers to either use low sulfur fuel instead of bunker fuel or install scrubbers to catch the uh, emissions. And the impact of this may be a little bit hard to follow on the slide, but the impact is ocean carriers have to burn much more expensive fuel as the low sulfur fuel costs about $250 to $300 more per ton than bunker fuel. And then if you're burning more expensive fuel, that will increase ocean carrier costs. But the million dollar question from that is, well, how does that fall into rates? Will ocean carrier rates increase and all water service, because it's a longer route, burns almost twice as much fuel per container as a West Coast route for traffic that originates in East Asia. So the ultimate impact for intermodal is, will this push freight that is going all water today back to the West Coast? And as I talked about earlier, cargo that lands on the West Coast has about a 70% chance of moving inland by rail either IPI or transloaded versus cargo that lands on the East Coast has a 20 to 25% chance of moving inland by rail. And I mentioned uh, earlier about the freight rates that uh, Drury uh, reports on. And so last summer, I think it's July, they reported on the, the Shanghai to Memphis rate via LA was about $4,100, but that was more expensive than the um, Savannah rate, uh, but uh, which was around $3,800, $3,900. So it was $200 less to go via Savannah to bring freight to Memphis last summer. But in the June report, Drury indicates that the opposite has occurred, that the rate over the U.S. West Coast to uh, Memphis via IPI was about that same number, 4130 as it was in July, but the rate via Savannah, instead of being the $3,800, $3,900, was now $4,400, so $200 to $300 more. So is that, that really is the case? Is that going to last all year? Is that going to, but if that really is the rate spread, then you might see some freight move back to the, the U.S. West Coast. The other thing that I didn't put on the slide, but is affecting all water, is the Panama Canal recently uh, changed their toll structure to reflect the fact that there's a drought in Panama and they're worried about the water levels and it's creating increased expense for the locks to move the ships in and out. And so they've increased the tolls to uh, reflect this, this fact. But how that factors again into ocean freight rates is yet to be determined. But it's another factor that we're watching, and that does have the potential if the 
Panama Canal tolls increase, and if those rates are passed on to the shippers, that may push freight back to either the West Coast or potentially put freight still going all water, but on a Suez Canal route. Okay, and to, to butcher a cliche, uh, collage is worth a thousand words. And so, uh, as, as I was talking to you earlier about the uh, trailer to container conversions, I thought I'd put this up as a really tells a tells a great story about the the extent of the conversions that we've seen in the past year or so. Interesting thing, a couple of things to point out in this. T to C conversion is happening with private shippers such as Amazon and Walmart. And so that really betrays the, I guess you could say the sophistication of their supply chain and how how interactive they are with the supply chain and how reliant they, are, they have become on intermodal. It's happening quite a bit with uh, the conversions with um, LTL carriers. As you can see, ABF, SDs, and and YRC have all taken um, positions. Oh, and, and of course, FedEx below, but FedEx has been in the market, container market longer. But all of those are new players to the uh, container side. And so they're, um, they see the long-term benefits and uh, economies of, of using double stack. And then finally, it, the reefer market has been a big proponent of switching over. Reefer or temperature-controlled containers or, or temperature control trailers has long been really tied in very closely with the trailer market. In fact, it's recently been about a third of all trailer shipments. And it's because of the relative merits of trailers versus containers. Uh, we talked about this in the last in our last webinar. A new technology has come out to allow the new domestic container temperature controlled units to have more floor space that would allow another row of pallets. And so that is for many players, it's tipped the balance in economies between using trailers and containers. And uh, these three per carriers are are dipping themselves m more deeply in the pool of uh, of the container side. And uh, one interesting thing that they're they're finding is at least one carrier has told me this that the the additional benefit they've found by using the container is that they can they can broaden their reach on the temperature controlled intermobile network as trailer lanes on the North American network are more limited than the container lanes. So this is actually broadening their options. Containers, of course, have, have some drawbacks, but it, it's really opened their market up to a wider, a wider network within the North American field. Outstanding, that's great, guys. Uh, thank you very much, I really appreciate it. The audience has been peppering us with, with questions along the way. So the first one is probably helpful for some of maybe our newer um, listeners, but um, can we restate the definition of all water? Is it only Asia to East Coast? Yes, yeah, it's only the, the East Asia region, which is a region that TTX made up, but it's China and countries nearby China. So Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, that part of the world. And roughly two thirds of the freight that originates there will land on the US West Coast. And one third of the freight will either route through the Suez Canal or through the Panama Canal and land on the East Coast, either up in Canada and Halifax or along the U.S. East Coast. Here's an interesting question. Should we be looking at 2018 and 2019 as an aggregate because of the tariff front loading? I think so. I think that's a, a fair way to do it. The calendar is the calendar, but if I had my way to, to how I would say the date is, I would look at 2018 as a 13th month year or, or 2019 as a 13th month year. So December of 18 really belongs in 2019, because so much of 19's freight moved in December of 18. And just to reiterate, we saw a spike. Uh, U.S. imports increased 20% in December of 18 over the prior year, and a 30% increase from China, a 20% increase overall. So that was, we think, shippers bringing freight in early before what was at that time a January 1st deadline for the uh, imposition of 25% tariffs. Turns out those tariffs did not go into effect until May, but people didn't know that at the time, so they were ordering goods to come in prior to the, the deadline. Here's a good one for, I think, again, some of the, the folks that, that may not have been able to sit in on some of the past ones. And I, I would encourage folks, if you're interested, uh, we've archived all of the, the past uh, webinars we've done for the last couple of years, so you can go back and, and um, kind of review all those. There's a lot of great information in there that's uh, still salient. So this question is, uh, what would three key sectors for an amateur to pay attention to 
to what affects the intermodal room. Somebody new to the industry, what what are the what are the, the sort of the three key things that, that they should start trying to get a handle on to, to start to pay arms? Well, trade is certainly one of the biggest things. Uh, that's one of the biggest drivers. Um, fuel prices are also a big part of it to keep an eye on uh, because you're competing quite a bit with trucking, um, and if fuel prices go way up. That helps intermodal to grow. If they go way down, the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I look at a lot of the uh, the index, uh, indexes. So this is it's more backwards looking than forwards looking. But some of the indexes that are that are are freely available that are, that are really good. Um, well, we showed showed one of them, which is the Morgan Stanley Truckload Freight Index. Uh, CAS has a CAS index is a, a monthly publication that's mm-hmm. fantastic. It's a fantastic read to give an idea on on current uh, current conditions. ATA publishes some information for free, some of it's on a subscription basis, and we, we use a variety of other market research sources. Right. And of course, there's always the Intermodal Association of North America's data. It's, uh, it's, it's of right. course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, to go as well. And, and here's one, is there any drill down data to de- determine that, that, that the long-term effects on intermodal of scheduled railroading and sort of the the lane rationalization? Uh, drill down, I, I got to say the short answer would be not that to my knowledge. Well, you, you can look in the ETSO data, so you can see regions that are that have been affected. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that would give you a good idea. Maybe not, it might not be railroad specific, but it would be region specific. So you may be able to see uh, regions and then compare that against public information available on what the railroads have what lanes railroads have rationalized. Here's an interesting one that I think picked up at least a little bit on, uh, particularly talking about sort of the connection with, with dry van freight and also drayage. Do you see that the FMCSA's drug clearinghouse initiative is, is going to have an impact on intervals? Uh, not immediately, but we think this is going to be a, a bigger issue as, as time goes on. Of course, this is so for those of you who don't know the FMCSA, they're really the, the federal administration that oversees carrier safety on the truckload side. And drug testing, of, of course, is, is mandatory in the transportation industry. Truck drivers are randomly tested. In fact, I believe it's 50% of all drivers or on a population basis, not specific drivers, but 50% of all drivers have to be tested on an annual basis now. And that's up from 25% last year. And if you do get tested positively, your positive test result goes into a, a, a new central database that, that's hosted by the federal government. And if you try to beat the system and jump ship once you've gotten a positive test, that used to be possible. Now it's not anymore because your information will go into the um, database. And any carrier that is hiring you is required by law to pull your record to ensure that you do not have a positive rating. So this is just starting to populate now. Of course, you, you didn't have to put in history into this into this database, and it just started up in the last month. But it will be cumulative. And so as carriers test, do either do pre pre employment screening or random testing or testing after accidents. Any positive findings that they uh, they experience will be sent into the database and. We do believe that it's going to have some issue on on the pressure on driver capacity. Maybe not this year, but certainly in 2021, it'll probably be discernible. Quickly get through it, but maybe two more, because we're we're kind of getting down on time. But in terms of industrial production, it looks like it slowed way down in 2019 and is now on track uh, to have similar numbers in 2020. Uh, Any insights there? No, that sounds about right, uh, as the overall economy is slowing down. Consumption is slowing down, uh, and industrial production is as well. That was another question uh, that kind of linked to exactly what you just said. Can you say anything more about consumer spending trends and how they might affect freight volumes? That's definitely an effect on freight volumes in many ways. Thank you, gentlemen. That was terrific. You sure gave us a great deal of information and a lot to think about. I look forward to keeping this discussion going throughout the following quarters of this year and beyond. For more information about topics like this, IANA membership, and how to get engaged, please visit intermodal.org or email us at info at intermodal.org. For more information on subscribing to our data products, the Intermodal Volume Analyzer, the Historic Intermodal Volume Analyzer, and the ETSO database, 
please visit the Resource Center at intermodal.org forward slash resource dash center and then select data and statistics. Thanks for joining us at IANA, the connecting force behind intermodal freight.